20,000 leagues under the sea, chapter 11, all by electricity. Sir, said Captain Nemo, showing me the instruments hanging on the walls of his room. Here are the contrivances required for the navigation of the Nautilus. Here, as in the drawing room, I have them always under my eyes, and they indicate my position and exact direction in the middle of the ocean. Some are known to you, such as the thermometer, which gives the internal temperature of the Nautilus, the barometer, which indicates the weight of the air and foretells the changes of the weather, the hygrometer, which marks the dryness of the atmosphere, the storm glass, the contents of which, by decomposing, announce the approach of tempests, meaning storm, the compass, which guides my course, the sextant, which shows the latitude by the altitude of the sun, chronometers by which I calculate the longitude and glasses for day and night, which I use to examine the points of the horizon, these binoculars, when the Nautilus rises to the surface of the waves. These are the usual nautical instruments, I replied, and I know the use of them, but these others, no doubt, answer to the particular requirements of the Nautilus. This dial with the movable needle is a manometer, is it not? It is actually a manometer, but by communication with the water, whose external pressure it indicates, it gives our depth at the same time. And these other instruments, the use of which I cannot guess? Here, Professor, I ought to give you some explanations. Will you be kind enough to listen to me? He was silent for a few moments, and then he said, There is a powerful agent, obedient, rapid, easy, which conforms to every use and reigns supreme on board my vessel. Everything is done by means of it. It lights it, warms it, and it's the soul of my mechanical apparatus. This agent is electricity. Electricity? I cried in surprise. Yes, sir. Nevertheless, Captain, you possess an extreme rapidity of movement, which does not agree well with the power of electricity. Until now, its dynamic force has remained under restraint and has only been able to produce a small amount of power. But let's remember that this was written the time before everything was powered with electricity. Professor, said Captain Nemo, my electricity is not everybody's. You know what seawater is composed of? In a thousand grams, I found 96.5% of water and about two and two third percent of chloride of sodium. And then, in a smaller quantity, chlorides of magnesium and of potassium, bromide of magnesium, sulfate of magnesia, sulfate and carbonate of lime. You see then that chloride of sodium forms a large part of it. So it's this sodium that I extract from seawater and which I compose my ingredients. I owe all to the ocean. It produces electricity. And electricity gives heat, light, motion, and in a word, life to the Nautilus. But not the air you breathe. Oh, I could manufacture the air necessary for my consumption, but it's useless, because I go up to the surface of the water when I please. However, if electricity does not furnish me with air to breathe, it works at least the powerful pumps that are stored in spacious reservoirs and which enable me to prolong at need and as long as I will my stay in the depth of the sea. It gives a uniform and unintermittent light which the sun does not. Now look at this clock. It's electrical and goes with a regularity that defies the best chronometers. I've divided it into 24 hours like Italian clocks because for me there is neither night nor day, sun nor moon but only that facetious light that I take with me to the bottom of the sea. Look, just now it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Exactly. Another application of electricity. This dial hanging in front of us indicates the speed of the Nautilus. An electric thread puts it in communication with the screw and the needle indicates the real speed. Look, now we're spinning along with a uniform speed of 15 miles an hour. It is marvellous. And I see, Captain, you are right to make use of this agent that takes the place of wind, water and steam. Oh, we've not finished, Monsieur Arax, said Captain Nemo, rising. If you will follow me, we will examine the stern of the Nautilus. Really, I knew already the anterior part of this submarine boat, of which this is the exact division, starting from the ship's head. 
The dining room, five yards long, separated from the library by a watertight partition. The library, five years long. Hang on a minute. The large drawing room, 10 yards long, separated from the captain's room by a second watertight partition. The said room, five yards in length, mine, two and a half yards. And lastly, a reservoir of air, seven and a half yards that extended to the bows. To the bows. Total length, 35 yards or 105 feet. The partitions had doors that were shut hermetically by means of India rubber instruments. And they ensured the safety of the Nautilus in case of a leak. I followed Captain Nemo through the waist and arrived at the centre of the boat. There was a sort of well that opened between two partitions. An iron ladder fastened with an iron hook to the partition led to the upper end. I asked the captain what the ladder was used for. It leads to a small boat, he said. What? Have you a boat? I exclaimed in surprise. Of course. An excellent vessel. Light and insubmersible, it won't sink. That serves either as a fishing or a pleasure boat. But then, when you wish to embark, you're obliged to come to the surface of the water? Not at all. This boat is attached to the upper part of the hull of the Nautilus and occupies a cavity made for it. It's decked quite watertight and held together by solid bolts. This ladder leads to a manhole made in the hull of the Nautilus that corresponds with a similar hole made in the side of the boat. By this double opening, I get into a small vessel. They shut the one belonging to the Nautilus. I shut the other by means of screw pressure. Oh, I've gone northern. I undo the bolts and the little boat goes up to the surface of the water with prestigious rapidity. I then open the panel of the bridge, carefully shut it till then, I mast it, hoist my sail, take my oars and I'm off. But how do you get back on board? I don't come back, Mr Aranax. The Nautilus comes to me. By your orders? By my orders. An electric thread connects us. I telegraph to it, and that is enough. Really, I said, astonished at these marvels. Nothing can be more simple. After having passed by the cage of the staircase that led to the platform, I saw a cabin six feet long, in which Consul and Ned Land, enchanted with their repast, were devouring it with avidity. So they were eating it like animals almost, and very quickly. Then a door opened into a kitchen, nine feet long, situated between the large storerooms. There, electricity, better than gas itself, did all the cooking. The streams under the furnaces gave out to the sponges of platina a heat which was regularly kept up and distributed. They also heated a distilling apparatus, which, by evaporation, furnished excellent drinking water. Near this kitchen was a bathroom, comfortably furnished with hot and cold water taps. Next to the kitchen was a berth room of the vessel, 16 feet long, but the door was shut and I couldn't see the management of it, which might have given me an idea of the number of men employed on board the Nautilus. At the bottom was a fourth partition that separated this office from an engine room. A door opened and I found myself in the compartment where Captain Nemo, certainly an engineer of a very high order, had arranged his locomotive machinery. This engine room, clearly lighted, did not measure less than 65 feet in length. It was divided into two parts. The first contained the materials for producing electricity and the second the machinery that connected it with the screw. I examined it with great interest in order to understand the machinery of the Nautilus. You see, said the captain, I use Bunsen's contrivances, not rum corps. These would not have been powerful enough. Bunsen's are fewer in number, but strong and large, which experience proves to be the best. The electricity produced passes forward where it works by electromagnets of great size on a system of levers and cogwheels that transmit the movement to the axle of the screw. This one, the diameter of which is 19 feet and the threads 23 feet, performs about 120 revolutions in a second. And you get then a speed of 50 miles an hour. I've seen the Nautilus manoeuvre before the Abraham Lincoln and I have my own ideas as to its speed, but this is not enough. We must see where we go. We must be able to direct it to the right, to the left, above, below. How do you get to the great depths where you find an increasing resistance, which is rated by hundreds of atmospheres? How do you return to the surface of the ocean? And how do you maintain yourselves in the requ requisite medium? Am I asking too much? Not at all, Professor, replied the captain with some hesitation. 
since you may never leave this submarine boat, come into the saloon. It is our usual study, and there you will learn all you need to know about the Nautilus. Chapter 12, Some Figures. A moment after we were seated on the divan in the saloon smoking, the captain showed me a sketch that gave the plan, section and elevation of the Nautilus. Then he began his description in these words. Here, Monsieur Arax, are the several dimensions of the boat you are in. It is an elongated cylinder with conical ends. It's very like a cigar in shape, a shape already adopted in London in several constructions of the same sort. The length of this cylinder from stem to stern is exactly 232 feet and its maximum breadth is 26 feet. It's not built quite like your long voyage steamers, but its lines are sufficiently long and its caves prolonged enough to allow the water to slide off easily and oppose no obstacle to its passage. These two dimensions enable you to obtain by a simple calculation the surface and cubic contents of the Nautilus. Its area measures 6,032 feet and its contents about 1,500 cubic yards. That is to say, when completely immersed, it displaces 50,000 feet of water or weighs 1,500 tonnes. When I made the plans for this submarine vessel, I meant that 19th should be submerged. Consequently, it ought only to displace 9 tenths of its bulk, that is to say, only to weigh that number of tonnes. I ought not, therefore, to have exceeded that weight, constructing it on the aforesaid dimensions. The Nautilus is composed of two hulls, one inside, the other outside, joined by T-shaped irons which render it very strong. Indeed, owing to this cellular arrangement, it resists like a block, as if it were solid. Its sides cannot yield. It coheres spontaneously, means it sticks together, and not by the closeness of its rivets, and its homogeneity of its construction due to the perfect union of the materials, enables it to defy the roughest seas. These two hulls are composed of steel plates, whose density is from 0.7 to 0.8 that of the water. The first is not less than two inches and a half thick and weighs 394 tonnes. The second envelope, the keel, 20 inches high and 10 thick, weighs alone 62 tonnes. The engine, the ballast, the several accessories and apparatus appendages, the partitions and bulkheads weigh nine six one point six two tons. Do you follow all this? I do. Then, when the Nautilus is afloat under these circumstances, one tenth is out of the water. Now, if you've made reservoirs of a size equal to this tenth, or capable of holding one hundred and fifty tons, and if I fill them with water, the boat weighing then 1,507 tonnes, will be completely immersed. That would happen, Professor. These reservoirs are in the lower parts of the Nautilus. I turn on taps and they fill, and the vessel sinks that has just been level with the surface. Well, Captain, but now we come to the real difficulty. I can understand your rising to the surface, but diving below the surface, does not your submarine contrivance encounter a pressure and consequently undergo an upward thrust of one atmosphere for every 30 feet of water, just about 15 pounds per square inch. Just so, sir. Then, unless you quite fill the Nautilus, I don't see how you can draw it down to those depths. Professor, you must not confound statics with dynamics, or you'll be exposed to grave errors. There is very little labour spent in attaining the lower regions of the ocean, for all bodies have a tendency to sink. When I wanted to find out the necessary increase of weight required to sink the Nautilus, I only had to calculate the reduction of volume that seawater requires according to the depth. That is evident. Now, if water is not absolutely incompressible, it is at least capable of a very slight compression. Indeed, after the most recent calculations, this reduction is only 0.000436 of an atmosphere for each 30 feet of depth. If you want to sink 3,000 feet, I should keep account of the reduction of bulk under a pressure equal to that column of water of 1,000 feet. Apologies if you can hear snoring. It's not me. 
The calculation is easily verified. Now, I have supplementary reservoirs capable of holding 100 tonnes. Therefore, I can sink to a considerable depth. When I wish to rise to the level of the sea, I only let off the water and empty all the reservoirs if I want the Nautilus to emerge from the tenth part of her total capacity. I had nothing to object to these reasonings. I admit your calculations, Captain, I replied. I should be wrong to dispute them since daily experience confirms them, but I foresee a real difficulty in the way. What's it? When you're about a thousand feet deep, the walls of the Nautilus bear a pressure of 100 atmospheres. If, then, just now you're going to empty the supplementary reservoirs to lighten the vessel and to go up to the surface, the pumps must overcome the pressure of 100 atmospheres, which is 1,500 pounds per square inch. From that, a power that electricity alone can give, said the captain hastily. I repeat, sir, that the dynamic power of my engines is almost infinite. The pumps of the Nautilus have an enormous power, as you must have observed when their jets of water burst like a torrent upon the Abraham Lincoln. Besides, I use subsidiary reservoirs only to maintain a mean depth of 750 to 1,000 fathoms and with a view of managing my machines. Also, when I have a mind to visit the depths of the ocean five or six miles below the surface, I make use of slower but not less infallible means. Why, well, Captain, this involves my telling you how the Nautilus is worked. I am impatient to learn. To steer this boat to starboard or port, to turn, in a word, following a horizontal plane, I use an ordinary rudder fixed on the back of the stern post and with one wheel and some tackle to steer by. But I can also make the Nautilus rise and sink and sink and rise by a vertical movement by means of two inclined planes fastened to its sides opposite the centre of the flotation. Planes that move in every direction and that are worked by powerful levers from the interior. If the planes are kept parallel with the boat, it moves horizontally. If slanted, the Nautilus, according to this inclination, and under the influence of the screw, either sinks diagonally or rises diagonally as it suits me. And even if I wish to rise more quickly to the surface, I ship the screw, and the pressure of the water causes the Nautilus to rise vertically like a balloon filled with hydrogen. Bravo, Captain. But how can the steersman follow the route in the middle of the water? The steersman is placed in a glazed box that is raised above the hull of the Nautilus and furnished with lenses. Are these lenses capable of resisting such pressure? Perfectly. Glass, which breaks at a blow, is nevertheless capable of offering considerable resistance. During some experiments of fishing by electric light in 1864 in the Northern Seas, we saw plates less than a third of an inch thick resist a pressure of 16 atmospheres. Now, the glass that I use is not less than 30 times thicker. Granted, but after all, in order to see, the light must exceed the darkness. And in the midst of the darkness in the water, how can you see? Behind the steerman's cage is placed a powerful electric reflector, the rays from which light up the sea for half a mile in front. Ah, bravo, bravo, Captain. Now I can account for this phosphorus in the supposed narwhal that puzzled us so. I now ask you if the boarding of the Nautilus and of the Scotia that has made such a noise has been the result of a chance recontra. Quite accidental, sir. I was sailing only one fathom below the surface of the water when the shock came. It had no bad result. None, sir. But now, about your recontra, that means um, a coming across. So when he banged into the Abraham Lincoln. Professor. I am sorry for one of the best vessels in the American Navy, but they attacked me and I was bound to defend myself. I contented myself, however, with putting the frigate hors of combat. She will not have any difficulty in getting repaired at the next port. Ah, Commander, your Nautilus is certainly a marvellous boat. Yes, Professor, and I love it as if it were a part of myself. If danger threatens one of your vessels on the ocean... The first impression is the feeling of an abyss above and below. On the Nautilus's, men's hearts never fail them. No defects to be afraid of, for the double shell is as firm as iron. 
no rigging to attend to, no sails for the wind to carry away, no boilers to burst, no fire to fear, for the vessel is made of iron, not of wood, no curl to run short, for electricity is the only mechanical agent, no collision to fear, for it alone swims in deep water, no tempest to brave, for when it dives below the water, it reaches absolute tranquility. There, sir, that is the perfection of vessels. And if it is true that the engineer has more confidence in the vessel than the builder, than the builder than the captain himself, you understand the trust I repose in my Nautilus, for I am at once captain, builder, and engineer. But how would you construct this wonderful Nautilus in secret? Each separate portion, Monsieur Arax, was brought from different parts of the globe. The keel was forged at Crusoe, the shaft of the screw at Penn and Company's London, the iron plates of the hull at Laird of Liverpool, the screw itself at Scots at Glasgow. The reservoirs were made by Cale and Co at Paris, the engine by Crump in Prussia, its beak in Matala's workshop in Sweden, its mathematical instruments by Hart Brothers of New York, and each of these people had my orders under different names. But these parts had to be put together and arranged. Professor, I'd set up my workshops on a desert island in the ocean. There, my workmen, that is to say, the brave man that I instructed and educated, and myself, had put together our Nautilus. Then, when the work was finished, fire destroyed all trace of our proceedings on this island that I could have jumped over if I'd liked. Then the cost of this vessel is great. Monsieur Aranax, an iron vessel cost £45 per tonne. Now the Nautilus weighed 1500 It came therefore to 67580 more for fitting it up and about 200000 with the works of art and the collections it contains. One last question, Captain Nemo. Ask it, Professor. You are rich? Immensely rich, sir. And I could, without missing it, pay the national debt of France. I stared at the singular person who spoke thus. Was he playing upon my credit? Cred, 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 oh. Was he saying that I didn't believe him? The future would decide that. <laughs>